Welcome to the SCURF Interviews Podcast and our first DSI project highlights. Today we have Patrick Joyce, Head of Operations, and Anton Levitt, the Community Lead from Research Hub. Enjoy the interview. Thank you for joining today. So uh, Anton and Pat, would you mind just quickly introducing yourselves and we'll go from there. Sure. So uh, my name is Patrick Joyce. I'm one of the co-founders of Research Hub. I'm a longtime science nerd. Uh, started a PhD in molecular biology after college, left with a master's, went to a couple years of medical school, um, ended up kind of seeing firsthand the issues uh, that exist within the funding and publishing infrastructure for science. So I took a year off of medical school and started a project where the idea was to create new incentives to help to encourage researchers uh, to partake in healthy research behaviors when they publish. Um, and so, yeah, I've been working on a DSI project for really about five years now. Um, have been collaborating on Research Hub for about two and a half years, which is where I met Anton. Yeah, we actually met maybe two years ago, right? Uh, a friend of mine and me, I'm, I'm a PhD student, almost, almost uh, defending soon, I guess. So almost a PhD. Uh, and we were starting another project and we were kind of trying to get the lay of the land of the people in the open science uh, startups. And that's where we met Patrick. And we shared a lot of the early ideas. And I think that's has been the case with uh, many early adopters of Research Hub, where they would discover that whatever they were doing at the time, Patrick was already doing it and was slightly ahead. So they decided to join Research Hub instead. I believe Thomas, who, uh, who is the same board, right? Yep. Yeah, he was working on another similar project, he decided to join forces instead. Yeah, it's really cool. And I know I only, uh, I, I, I learned uh, of Research Hub shamefully late, given the cool work that y'all have been doing for a few years now. But it would be interesting to hear kind of what some of those early days were like, how it got started. Uh, and yeah, just what the beginning of the Research Hub journey was like. We've been on the Ethereum mainnet uh, since August of 2020 and had a like MVP web app for maybe nine months before that. Um, it's been a long journey, I'd say. I remember um, for probably like the first year and a half, I was at the top of the leaderboard just from like posting a paper once a day. And now we have like a bunch of actual scientists who are at the top of the leaderboard. So it looks a lot better now. Um, but yeah, I think it's it's been a lot of kind of um, grinding away um, and building relationships with people like Anton who... Like, correct me if I'm wrong, Anton, but I'm not sure those early days of Research Hub were giving you a ton of utility personally as a scientist. It was more about like buying into a potential future state that could help to improve academia. I mean, I think that's not unusual for the open science projects. I think the researchers kind of have this mindset that they have to be early adopters of stuff and projects just because because of the nature of open science uh projects that they are a little a little bit of a slow burn type of thing where you can't immediately expect to have you know high utility you have to invest and help the creators build it a little bit and then maybe in the future it will uh, help you with whatever is uh, the problem you're trying to solve but yeah it, it was early days it was all about getting in touch with more you know actual researchers i think that's still the main goal because utility wise i think research hub is already pretty up there it's just needs needs a little bit of push in terms of the the community and the number of people who use it actively it's one of those things where it's it's not enough to be just good enough it also needs to be popular somehow magically <laughs> Yeah, and I guess on that note, just to zoom in on the utility question, kind of how do you two view the value add of Research Hub to a scientist? Yeah, so for me personally, I think one of the craziest things in the industry, and I know a lot of people agree here, is that scientific publishers get to um, charge for like publishing content, both from the content creators, the scientists, and the people consuming the content or um, whoever's paying for subscriptions on the back end. So it's a, you know, it's a really crazy business model where like 
the New York Times, for instance, pays for authors to like create articles and then earns money on subscriptions, you know, from the investment that they made in those articles. While scientific journals, they make money from the author and from the subscribers. So one thing that Research Hub can do right now is essentially act as a preprint server where scientists can share their manuscripts. And while we don't have peer review or anything like that right now, uh, we're hoping to get to the point where it's a viable option to publish a paper in Research Hub. And uh, we want to create an industrial norm uh, for the companies hosting this content to pay the authors for creating it. So one of the nice things that we can do is help to compensate um, scientific authors with ResearchCoin uh, for uh, sharing their content un under an open access license. So that way anyone can learn from it. Got it. So the main point of the token me mechanism is to incentivize that more open access publishing. Yep. Healthy research behaviors in general. So one of the like lowest hanging fruit there is like sharing preprints, um, open access publishing. But then something we want to get into over time is like helping to break down the silos in science, um, help to uh, have people be properly uh, accredited for their research outputs that they share um, and create incentives where you can actually make more money if me and Anton decide to collaborate on a project than necessarily work on them independently and hope to be the first one who can actually publish it. I think the, the collaborative incentive alignment is something that's really exciting to see uh, in Research Hub and in some other projects. And Anton, I wonder, especially when you were just getting into Research Hub, kind of what was your view? Were you already in Web3? Were you already kind of excited for how this space can affect the scientific world? Or was this kind of uh, the first foray was that initial exploration and, and joining the organization eventually? Oh, I wasn't into Web3 at all. And I think that's one of the big barriers for all the open science related uh, projects in the DSI space because the, most of the academics are pretty conservative in that regard. They don't exactly know how Web3 works. Some have you know, certain prejudice towards it. So I would say it took me a while to uh, realize what are the benefits of it. If you really think about it, there are so many activities currently in the research pro process that are not highlighted and they're not rewarded, but they are required for the healthy development of a field, right? So the peer review is, you know, rarely uh, credited in any way. The, the just the discussions and uh, generating ideas in, is, is not always credited, right? So that always happens behind the scenes. You approach people with your research and you talk to them and they don't get, you know, they didn't get enough contribution to be a co-author on your paper, but they have provided some uh, input. So it would be nice to be able to uh, reward them somehow, right, in, in a systematic way. And that's why I think the Web3 is really good for that, because it's, uh, let's say, fragmentary in, in that regard, as in you can assign value to actions that you find healthy for the scientific process. So right now we are experimenting with a D work, right? With the custom goals. You know, what kind of interactions you expect between researchers that you think are valuable enough to contribute something that has actual monetary value, right? And for example, if someone were to criticize your paper openly, even after publication, right? That's that's an interaction that's very healthy for the community, but currently it's absolutely invisible and unrewarded in a systematic fashion in the current uh, paradigm, I guess. And that's something that could easily be fixed with a web-free application. Yeah, I mean, I feel like we can go down a whole rabbit hole of just peer review related questions, but I'll save that for, for a separate discussion. But I wonder, in terms of the, the process of initially growing the community, what were some of the, the pain points? Was it kind of what you were alluding to with that reticence from the scientific community around Web3? Was it just, yeah, I mean, what, what were sort of the points of uh, the pain points that you were experiencing initially? I think in general, academic science is a ridiculously competitive field. In the U.S., biomedical sciences, it's something like 1% of first-year PhD students end up being research professors. So just the odds are really stacked against 
graduate students when it comes to like their chances of success at like the career they want to have in theory in academia. And so I think one of the biggest uh, issues that we've come across is um, convincing like early career scientists that one, this is worth their time. Because in theory, like that's taking away from things they could be doing to progress their own career. And then two, that it's not actually a career risk. If you are to like share a preprint or like talk about your work in the open before it's actually published in a peer reviewed journal, um, a lot of people, I think very reasonably, are hesitant to do so because they perceive there's a risk of being scooped or have, having basically like someone else come and run with their ideas faster than they can. So yeah, I think I think in general there's like a um, like a reasonable hesitance towards tokens and Web three, and then also uh, towards like academic activities outside of like the standard path towards having a like academic research career. Yeah, and I wonder, Anton, especially since you joined and uh, and were contributing on the community growth side, were there any other elements that kind of uh, came up, or is there a change of sort of what were the concerns in kind of two-ish years ago when you were just getting involved versus how things look now? I think one of the uh, persistent concern that was a uh, big thing back back in the day and still is, and uh, I imagine it will be in the foreseeable future, is that academics are not really quite certain about the status of their of the ip of the research that they produce who it belongs to what they can share what they can't share uh, and when we invite people to contribute on research hub one of the first questions they ask okay so what if i share a paper am i the author of the paper can i share someone else's paper and for some people it's not even an obvious question they they legitimately think that this is a portal where you can share only your own paper. And I would say that that's not a specific concern for Research Hub, but also for just other platforms that require you to somehow deal with uh, intellectual rights for your uh, publications, right? Because it's so convoluted in a way. I don't know if it's purposefully convoluted or not. Could be, right? But I think it's generally the case that whenever a person chooses a career where they have to be an absolute expert in one very narrow field, they kind of avoid getting into rabbit holes in other domains of their life. And so many of the researchers I know have little to no idea about the, the IP status of their work that they submit to the, uh, to the publishers. And so they just try to avoid it, avoid uh, ambiguous situations as in uploading stuff to Research Hub, just in case. Maybe it's not that bad, but just in case, I won't do it. Yeah, of course. The the I mean, that's a big deal. And the folks don't want to just rush into potentially jeopardizing years of work. So that's understandable. And I guess from the perspective of the kind of folks who you have been, the kind of scientists who have been uh, joining Research Hub and actively engaging in the community, uh, is there a sense of how many were already actively looking for some kind of more open solution uh, and they just happened to come across Research Hub or kind of what, what, I don't know if there is a single typical user journey, but have you noticed kind of a trend or some trends of where these scientists are coming from? Yeah, so demographic wise, um, I think it's a lot of like late stage PhD students and early career researchers, um, people who I think are disenchanted with the current state of academia and are looking for a way to contribute to making a positive change. Um, when it comes to openness, yeah, I think I would say like 75 to 80 percent of our like most dedicated community members right now are very motivated by like open science. Actually, the way that I got in touch with Anton was because um, his friend, shout out Nami, um, hosted a open science journal club on GitHub. So I just saw that repo and was like, oh, these people are probably like right up our alley. And I sent a cold email and, you know, now we're two years later here on a podcast. So, um, yeah, I think I think the most compelling part of Research Hub currently for like a, um, you know, totally new scientist who stumbles across us is that like we can help to uh, like accelerate the adoption of the open scientific culture 
And I think it's a big reason why a lot of people are spending their time now trying to help us grow. In my experience, it's either either the people are the web free uh, followers or the open science uh, advocates. And there is a little bit of overlap, but I don't think it's too big, honestly. Yeah, and I wonder, I mean, I, I, I feel like the gap between those two is unfortunately large. And do you feel like it's narrowing at all? Or does it feel just as large as it was two years ago? Or if not even larger, given the amount of noise coming out of the Web3 space in, in the last year or so? I think it's definitely narrowing. Um, I think people are starting to recognize uh, the tools within Web3 as like, yeah, tools that can help fix a lot of the problems in science. Um we're close with the Center for Open Science, which makes a product called Open Science Framework, which is a place where scientists can share like all of the data around their projects and also preprints. And we've been in discussions with them to potentially use tokens to help to incentivize um, not quite peer review, but uh, author attestations that they have. For instance, when someone publishes a preprint on Open Science Framework, they can offer to claim whether they have open data associated with the manuscript or if there was a pre-registration associated with it. And so uh, Center for Open Science essentially wants to help incentivize random people to fact check these authors. So if someone claims that they have open data, they would reward a random person with tokens uh, for double checking to make sure that that paper does actually have open data. So I think some of the kind of like bigger established players in the open science field are excited by like what's happening in the Web3 community and see it as like a potential fix for some of the issues um, that happen now where scientists are hesitant to fully participate in these like open scientific behaviors just because it, it doesn't really make sense for them personally incentive wise. They're not like dogmatic about open science, and they'd rather prioritize their own career. So using tokens to help to encourage these behaviors is a great way to actually get like the average person to have it make sense for them to share openly and collaborate with people across the world, um, kind of similarly to how open science frameworks facilitates those types of interactions. Yeah, and I wonder, Anton, when you were uh, kind of uh, on the journey of getting in, involved in Research Hub, was that already part of a, a big kind of push on your end as someone who was just exploring and, and kind of doing their PhD of what are more open options for uh, publishing and research communities? Or do you mind sharing a little bit of kind of what got you excited in looking in the open science direction in the first place? Yeah, 100%. Honestly, my department, I would say, is a pretty, let's say, advanced in terms of open uh, science practices and, and psychology in general, because if you are familiar with the reproducibility crisis, has been burned by the lack of uh, openness and transparency. So a lot of the open science uh, initiatives stem from psychology now, just because we, you know, we have so much demand for it. And so, yeah, definitely I was already kind of trained to look for uh, open science solutions. I wouldn't say I, I expected expected developments to come from the web-free world. I think it still needs more examples for people to learn that web-free can be used in that fashion. That reminds me of the, this recent case where a researcher crowdsourced one of the tokens to get some of the processing time on the supercomputer for uh, his quantum research or something like that. Patrick, do you remember this one? Yeah, it was through Mirror. He did a Mirror blog and raised, I think, like four ETH or something in order yeah, to get like uh, quantum compute time. No, I, I wonder, I mean, honestly, I think the the easiest and the most obvious uh, use case for the web free or for any tokens in open science would be the in some for, form of crowdsourcing but i guess that's not a very unique feature right you could crowdsource with you know with the traditional currencies so i wonder if uh one of the newer tokens will have some specific uh functionality and how it's distributed that will be tailored for open science. But I struggle to see it at the moment. 
And I guess on, on the general note of open science, were there any other kind of inspirations for either one of you or just projects that got you excited, uh, either when you were just getting started into this direction or now that you're, you're so deeply involved in, in building and supporting research up? Yeah, so I have a couple. Um, I think like uh, maybe non-traditional answer, Reddit. Um, there are a lot of subreddits that are just incredibly powerful where it's like super concentrated experts in a subfield of science where you can learn a lot. I like uh, um, our immunopsychiatry uh, personally. Um, when I was in medical school, our medical student was unbelievably helpful. So I think Reddit in general is a great example of experts crowdsourcing opinions. Um, another one, which I'm a huge fan of is like lame to say, but GitHub, um, there's like one of my, uh, favorite scientists that I've met through working on DSI projects, uh, worked for a lab at UPenn, uh, called the green lab. And so, um, when COVID first hit, uh, this lab is like uh, very technologically advanced and is, uh, very motivated by open science. And so they just started uh, reviewing every preprint openly on a GitHub repo uh, that would come out about COVID. Just a bunch of scientists together saying, hey, like, we're all reading these papers. Might as well share our thoughts in the open, uh, you know, under a CC license. That way anyone can learn from it. So that's uh, the Green Lab on GitHub has, like, awesome manuscript reviews. Um, and then the last one, which I find, like, like very, very inspiring is by a uh, psychologist um, in the Netherlands named uh, Dr. Chris Harkerink um, called Liberate Science. I think it's Research Equals is the name of the project. But the idea here is to try and dismantle uh, the scientific paper as the standard unit of communication for science. And so he's created like a uh, distributed database where scientists can share uh, micro publications or little tiny bits of research in the open um, in order to prevent like publication delays. So when information is created, it's immediately shared and anyone can uh, build on top of it by citing like those tiny micro publications. So research equals is also another like kind of web three project that I think is very inspiring. Yeah. Also a big fan of research equals and honestly, it it's just in general that's very much the case for me and many other researchers that you are sitting on a ton of unfinished work right as in data that are not exciting enough to maybe publish as a you know standalone article but still useful for someone but you know not not valuable enough for you to write an intro and conclusions for so i i'm big proponent of in for research equals and in general for uh, for other outlets in science that people should be able to share other types of uh, output right they should be able to share just just databases and let it be the uh, recognized type of citation right they should be able to share just the just the introduction just the you know teasing the hypothesis without actually doing anything more that would be good enough right that would be an interesting thing to re read and tease your brain before you go and do your own research and just other type of media a video looking forward to the world in which you could actually include a video in your cv as a respectable line right uh, dance your dissertation. <laughs> Multi multimodal papers are are going to be uh, very very exciting. What are you hopeful for in terms of DSI and open science in general going forward? Well, it would be really nice if the traditional academia will get a little bit more in touch with the web free in general. Just because right now there is a, an unhealthy divide, I would say that people don't really recognize the functionality as much as they should. And yeah, I just hope for more openness in on all fronts, including the one that I just highlighted for uh, you know to consider what what could be could be in a, a publication, right? So we could revise all the traditions that we currently have and maybe reconsider which uh, ones are a little bit outdated, perhaps, and don't need to be uh, like this. For example, the traditional publishing system that in which somehow in the world where the majority of the journals are not even you know, paper back anymore and somehow you get charged more for 
colored graphs <laughs> in your article as if it will require ink to print it. Yeah, so stuff like that would be nice to get rid of. And maybe actually a slight shift in understanding of the intellectual property of the represented by the articles. I know Patrick and uh, the rest of the team talked about NFTs a little bit, and I'm actually looking forward to the world in which uh, the offer will have an actual tangible ownership of the paper, perhaps in form of tokens that they are free to sell or hold or whatever else they want to do with them. But I think that just being able to conceptualize and visualize these tokens will perhaps do good for people's understanding of what they actually own and have rights for. That will, I think that will be really healthy for science in general. Absolutely. And I, I feel like anyone who is paying attention to the decentralized portion or the open science portion gets very excited by truly making it more accessible. So yeah, Patrick, I, I would want to ask you the same thing of sort of what are your, what are your sort of hopes and, and elements that get you most excited going forward? Yeah, so I think it's like two part, you know, in my view, one is accelerating open science. I think it's something like 30% of papers right now are published openly, and it's a uh, exponential curve. So it's looking good for adoption. But I think having like uh, the financial stability portion that can come with a Web3 token will really help to uh, make it make sense to the average scientist to participate in these open science behaviors. And so, so that's one piece that I'm excited for is added incentive for open publishing, open discussion. Another piece is um, kind of breaking down the ivory tower of academia. So one thing that I love about GitHub is anyone can use it. Like software engineering in general, um, you're only limited by your access to the internet. Like you can learn from open source projects, um, write your own code, get feedback from other people online, and you can become a pretty talented developer um, really anywhere in the world and there's not a lot of like geographical barriers to stop you from doing that um academia is not like that you need to be you know in a like tier one research institution in order to have the resources that are required in order to produce like extremely high quality academic knowledge and one thing that i think web3 will really unlock is the ability to have it make financial sense for anyone in the world to spend their time learning from and contributing to science. So, you know, maybe you're not born in London or Germany or Massachusetts or California, but if you can get online and, you know, earn a couple bucks an hour for reading papers and being curious, over time, uh, that effort can snowball into extremely valuable contributions. So I think Web3 is going to drastically increase the number of people who see themselves as scientists and who like essentially create a viable opportunity uh, for these people to um, earn a little bit of money and make it sustainable for them to, to learn and contribute to academia. That's great. And I, get, I also just wanted to quickly double check uh, in terms of Web3 usage on the Research Hub side, are there any other kind of Web3 tools beyond token incentivization for the open access publishing? Are there any other elements that you would say kind of uh, are incorporating Web3 tools at the moment? In theory, Research Coin is a governance token. So we do use it uh, for some governance decisions. Um, for instance, like uh, what is the structure of our hubs? We recently had our first uh, governance vote where essentially uh, the community got together, created a proposal about how our hubs would be structured. And so, um, yeah, the vote passed and we're implementing it currently. Um, in addition, uh, we have like research coin budgets for the community in order to allocate to do all kinds of different things, like maybe participate in DeFi protocols, like help to fund different researchers. Um, so community decision making, I think, is also kind of powerful. Um, in the future, we plan on implementing things like Arweave to help with like decentralized storage of the like content created on Research Hub. But yeah, right now, um, Research Hub essentially is like a, a Web2 app that has a token component 
where people can withdraw their research coin earnings on the website to Ethereum and then participate in the like Ethereum infrastructure and use those tokens for voting decisions in the community. That's great. Thank you for clarifying that. And I guess just as we're coming to a close, I want to just give both of you a chance to either mention anything in particular, whether it's milestones on Research Hub or, or personal kind of uh, projects in the, in the science direction uh, and where people can learn more about Research Hub. Yeah, definitely. So what I'm really excited for is the past couple of months of the editor program, like we like to call it. Uh, essentially, we have um, PhDs and masters in a bunch of different fields who are um, essentially caretaking individual hubs. For instance, Anton's uh, one of the editors of the Psychology Hub. And we have um, just under 100 weekly active users of masters and PhDs who are uh, helping to like take care of these individual hubs. So um, I think the content on Research Hub has gotten a lot more exciting over the past couple of months. And so we're hoping that will be able to scale into the future. Yeah, that's what I'm most excited for. Yeah, I personally, I'm excited for something that's uh, almost inevitable. That, that's why I'm pretty optimistic. As uh, the number of people using Research Hub increases, I expect more and more meaningful interactions between users, right? So uh, it, it some of the more amazing moments in academia, the reason I am in academia, are happening outside of the rooms and uh, lecture halls where I talk to excited people about research in the small conversations where I learn something or I share something. They just make, I don't know, they make my blood flow. And uh, that's the type of interactions I think will become more and more common on Research Hub. In, in fact, I am expecting within a year to use Research Hub for my dopamine kick of the day to get in, have a quick chat with some of the excited individuals. Uh, doesn't matter if they are you know, experts in the field or they're just curious, rewarding either way. And yeah, that's pretty much it. All the other good stuff with uh, incentivization for me is just an added bonus to all the cool and exciting interactions that I'm hoping to uh, get in the future and get in now. Yeah, it's exciting to think how powerful that community component is. But yeah, I really appreciate both of you joining the conversation today and giving a glimpse into some of the background of Research Hub and how you got here. We'll make sure to include links to Research Hub itself and the Twitter and all the any other relevant socials. Uh, and I'll follow up with you offline to, to make sure we capture all that information. But yeah, just thank you again uh, for joining today. Thanks for having us, Eugene. And thanks for organizing all of this in the community building in the DSI space. Um, really excited to see where this goes in the next year. Yeah, thank you. It was a pleasant conversation.